Hi, this is Katie Dwight, and I'm here with Brad Adams, and we are um, presenting this second webinar of the CDVA on the job training. And um, <clears throat> uh, today we're going to be covering, this is the second webinar, so we're going to be sort of loosely covering chapters 9 to 16 in the training manual. And um, but we're not we're not going to do a total summary of everything. Instead, we are we are picking out a few issues that we're going to focus on and in detail. And um, just think that that's it's it's hard to try to summarize everything in the amount of time we have. So just picking out a couple issues that we think are either complicated or you know particularly important uh, to focus on. And so. Today what we have is uh, we're going to be starting out with uh, the death pension and elderly, types of claims, VA hearings, enrollment and priority groups, other than honorable discharges and health care, fee basis health care, and vocational rehabilitation. Uh, so I'm going to start it out. I'm a senior staff attorney with Swords to Plowshares, and Brad Adams is a staff attorney and director of legal services for Swords to Plowshares. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to cover is um, pension and long-term care. Uh, this will be pretty quick, but I think it's important to understand how this works. For elderly veterans or their surviving spouses. So with the VA pension or death pension, uh, basically uh, eligible surviving spouses in assisted living, in home care, living in boarding care or nursing homes are entitled to aid and attendance, which con considerably increases the amount of income that they receive. Uh, but the cost of the care is also deductible as a medical expense. So what that means is that otherwise uh, eligible surviving spouses that would be disqualified due to too much income from Social Security or private pension or whatever um, are now able to receive the pension. And that takes the benefit from one that is usually thought of as just helping uh, the impoverished to becoming more of a middle class benefit. So for instance, if you have an elderly person who is receiving $3,500 a month in Social Security, uh, they can take all that money and pay it to a nursing home and then that will reduce their countable income to zero so they can receive the full VA pension, and they can use that money as they see fit to pay uh, to also pay for their nursing home or personal expenses or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but you should never advise uh, someone about any benefits except those that you have expertise in. And so, uh, Medicare and Medicaid are considerations when applying for veterans benefits, but Veterans should be always referred to experts in those areas. A major consideration with those is the amount of income and assets an individual or married couple has. Both VA pension and uh, Medicaid have similar but not identical income limits. However, Medicaid, Medicaid and VA pensions have different asset limits. Uh, one might qualify for aid and attendance but not qualify for Medicaid. But it is worth noting, though, that a qualified Medicaid planning professional should be able to assist a veteran in structuring their finances to, to uh, qualify for whatever they're able to qualify for. So that's, that's that on that topic. Um, I'm going to talk now about types of claims. Just going to go over types of claims. So first of all, we have incomplete claims. And there, the term incomplete is replacing the 
uh, the, the term informal claim. Uh, we don't have the concepts informal and formal anymore or starting on March 24th. Instead, we have incomplete or complete claims. So an, an incomplete claim uh, can occur where a veteran initiates a claim on e-benefits but does not complete the application. In that case, an effective date is established the, of it, as the day of the initiation of the claim and they have a year uh, from that date to complete the application in order to save the effective date. You can also file and preserve an, an effective date by filing uh, intent to file a claim VA form 210966. Or you can, through a public contact or a hotline personnel, a veteran can also have, um, have a, a form 21-0966 filled out by the, by the VA employee and submitted that way to preserve an effective date. Complete claims are ones that are submitted on formal application forms. And they must be signed, they must describe the condition, they must identify the benefits sought, and the statement, of, if it's a pension application, there must be a statement of income. Original claims are the very first benefit claim filed for a class of benefits such as disability or death benefits. So if you have a veteran who applied for disability um, for the first time, that is the original claim. And then every other time after that that he applies, that will never be an original claim again. That could, um, is likely to be a new claim, which is a class uh, a newly claimed condition within a class of benefits already applied for. So if you've already applied for disability benefits but you're applying for a different condition, that would be a new claim. Claims for increase and claims of non, for non-service connected pension are always considered new. No matter how many times a veteran applies, as long as the veteran alleges that a fact relating to entitlement to the benefit has changed since the last adjudication. Also, a claim following a change to the rules for uh, entitlement to a benefit is a new claim. So if the VA changes regulations um, that affect your claim and you reapply, that would be a new claim, even though it's for the same disability. So reopened claims are filed after a final VA denial and after the time for appeal has elapsed. And to succeed with a reopened claim, the veteran must submit new and material evidence. Uh, this should be um, distinguished from what is sometimes referred to a reopen or a reconsideration claim, which is where you submit evidence within the appeal period within one year from the date of the uh, rating decision letter. Uh, that I've heard that called a, a claim to reopen, and but that's not the same as this because those uh, are, are submitted within the time uh, limit for appeal. The, the time for appeal has not yet lapsed, whereas with what I'm talking about here, reopen claims, time for appeal has lapsed. In order to be successful, you must submit new and material evidence. And new evidence means existing evidence not previously submitted to agency decision makers. Material evidence means existing evidence that by itself or when considered with previous evidence of record relates to an unestablished fact necessary to substantiate the claim. New and material evidence can be neither cumulative nor redundant of the evidence of record at the time of the last prior final denial of the claim and must raise a reasonable possibility of substantiating the present claim. Um, 
To determine what is new and material requires reviewing the previous dial, denial to determine what reasons the adjudicator gave for denying the claim. For example, a veteran was in a car accident in service and injured her left knee. This is documented in STRs. She has a current diagnosis of the left knee condition. And she submits a letter from the doctor stating that her current knee condition is more than likely related to the car accident in service. However, the CMP examiner, while confirming a current injury, says the current condition is not connected to the car accident and the VA denied service connection. If the veteran submits another doctor's letter in which the doctor diagnoses a current injury, is that new and material? It's not because it's redundant of past evidence. The basis of the de denial here was, a, was not a, a, a nexus made between the in-service injury and the current disability. So, any new material evidence must address that fact. Buddy statements uh, confirming that the veteran was indeed in a car accident will not be new and material because it was not, does not relate to the basis for denial. Another letter from the same doctor re reiterating what was stated before would probably not be new and material, but if the doctor cited new evidence or new research, then it could be. The VA may not reject evidence as new and material just because it doesn't believe the evidence. It's only once the claim is reopened that the evidence could be found lacking in credibility. The VA is supposed to have a very pro-veteran standard for reopening, so it shouldn't be too strict. If a case was denied for two reasons and the new evidence only addresses one of the two, it should be sufficient to reopen the claim. So I'm just going to go over a couple of examples here. Um, claim for service connection for lower back disability, which includes a veteran's own statement of current symptoms and a description of in-service injury. The claim is denied for lack of medical evidence of current lower back disability and no in-service evidence of an injury and the decision becomes final. Veteran submits claim to reopen, submitting another statement describing in greater detail the lower back disability and the pain he experiences, along with buddy statements describing the accident. The buddy statements are new and material, but do not on their own raise the reasonable possibility of substantiating the claim. But with the new statement from the claimant, the VA is likely to reopen. It will probably be reopened. Uh, the next example, veteran submits claim for depression with evidence of recent diagnosis by VA psychiatrist. STR shows symptoms of anxiety and nervousness 20 years earlier. The CMP examiner opines that current depression is not related to service because in-service symptoms were acute and situational. The VA denies the decision becomes final. The vet attempts to reopen submitting a new opinion from a treating psychiatrist stating the current depression started many years ago. Would this be enough to open the, reopen the claim? Now, the claim was denied for lack of ed evidence of a nexus, and many years ago is pretty inconclusive. Uh, so probably that would not be sufficient to open reopen the claim. Finally, uh, last example here, veteran submits a claim for shoulder injury. Evidence in STR shows a shoulder injury in service sufficient to cause long-lasting disability. The veteran submits no evidence to current disability and CMP exam reveals only mild, non-compensable symptoms. The claim is denied. The denial becomes final. Veteran submits claim to reopen and informs the VA that he is receiving SSI based in part on the shoulder injury. Must the VA obtain Social Security records in order to determine whether there is new and material evidence? Yes, they must. 
they must obtain records reasonably identified by the veteran. But as stated in a former slide, they do not have to provide a CMP exam to assist the veteran to uh, get new and material evidence. Okay, so moving on to other types of claims, we have clear and unmistakable error. Those are claims where the true facts were known at the time of the decision but were not uh, before the adjudicator, or the law in effect at the time was incorrectly applied, or both of those things occurred, and the error had not been made. Had the error not been made, the outcome would have been manifestly different. So a case that's appealed all the way to CAVC or the Federal Circuit cannot be challenged by a Q claim. A BVA decision cannot be challenged until the period for appeal to CAVC has passed. Q claims can attack BVA decisions, and the BVA will handle those claims. Final regional office decisions can also be challenged and we will be handled by the regional office. But a claim that was appealed to the BVA, BVA cannot be attacked at the regional office. If challenging a BVA case, it must be in the form of a motion identifying the issues being challenged and setting forth the alleged clear and unmistakable error of fact or law. Uh, what type of error is sufficient? It must be absolutely clear that a different outcome would have resulted. It cannot be an incorrect diagnosis relied upon by an adjudicator. So you cannot have a doctor write a letter stating that, stating that he'd read the other doctor's diagnose and, diagnosis and believe that it was wrong. You cannot submit that um, and win that case as un, clear and unmistakable error. Where an application of law is at issue, the law must be considered as it existed at the time. And the harmless error rule applies, which means if the error is clear but would not in and of itself change the outcome of the case, then the Q claim is denied. Uh, finally, we have pending claims a claim which is awaiting a decision or where there has been a decision but it is not yet final, and finally adjudicated claims, which is uh, the claims in which a decision has been made and the veteran has allowed the specified appeal period to expire or the appellate authority has rendered a final decision. And that's it on types of claims, and I'm going to now turn it over to Brad uh, for to talk about VA hearings. Hi everyone, this is Brad Adams. I'm going to address three topics. First one is hearings. Talk about the purpose of a hearing, when a claimant can request a hearing, and how to prepare for them. Uh, a hearing, when we talk about hearings, we're talking about um, an opportunity to discuss a claim directly with a VA decision maker. We're not talking about comp and pen exams. Those are consultations between the veteran and a doctor. This is going to be a meeting um, between a veteran uh, or the claimant, um, also claimant's representatives, also other people, witnesses, um, if the claimant wants to bring other people to talk about some issue. Um, any of those people uh, can meet with and, and talk directly with the VA uh, decision maker on a claim. Um, to talk about any issue. Uh, it's a discussion in a sense that it's, it's non-adversarial. That's a term that we use legally, non-adversarial. Uh, at, at this point, um, when we're doing um, hearings at the regional office, also hearings, we'll talk about hearings at the, at the Board of Veterans Appeal, Appeals. Um, at this point, everyone is still officially on the same team. No one is trying to argue with the veteran or claimant or disprove anything. It's an opportunity for the claimant uh, representative to put all the information on the table um, so that the VA can make the decision which is most favorable to the, um, to the veteran, give the VA opportunity to ask any questions, have a discussion, flesh, flesh anything, anything out. Um, it's, uh, it's really more like a conversation than any kind of courtroom hearing that you might um, have in mind. Uh, they are uh, pretty informal. They're usually in a conference room or just someone's office. Um, 
you, um, as I say, you can bring witnesses. Um, you might bring a witness if you want to bring, uh, for example, a family member um, who would talk about how a disability has affected you in your daily life, if that's the issue. Um, you could bring a, um, um, a buddy from, from service who can talk about an event that happened in service. You could also uh, bring um, a doctor who could provide more information about a medical condition or diagnosis, if that's the issue. Um, this is all uh, optional. Uh, none of these are required. In fact, a hearing like this is always optional for the veteran. It is never required. Unlike a CNP exam, where the VA is going to request it, and uh, the veteran will, will have to appear for that, that CNP exam or reschedule it, um, a hearing is always going to be uh, asked for uh, by the veteran on their initiative, and it's always optional. It's never required for the VA to make a, make a decision. Uh, why are these useful? Um, like I say, it's different from a CN, CNP exam. Uh, in what cases is it helpful to have a direct communication with the VA adjudicator about a claim? Uh, one reason that often comes up is if it's a complicated issue. Often, uh, in fact, usually hearings happen on appeal after there's already been a decision and it's been denied. Uh, so the VA has rejected the claim, so clearly there's a disagreement. Um, you as a representative or the veteran or claimant might feel that the VA made a mistake. This is an opportunity to explain verbally and directly and to have a you know, discussion back and forth about why you think that the outcome should have been different. That can be helpful for complicated issues. A second circumstance we're hearing it can be helpful is where there's competing evidence. Um, so for example, if you have a you had a CMP exam and the doctor the CMP doctor provided a certain rating. Um, but you know that the veteran or the claimant ha or the, the veteran has been getting private medical care for a long time um, from a different doctor who provided it, you know recommended a higher rating. Um, here you have competing evidence. You have two doctors providing uh, different outcomes. That VA rater is going to decide between them. Sitting down with that rater is an opportunity to explain why you think that um, this, in this example, the private medical evidence is um, sort of more valuable, should be weighed more heavily than the CNP exam. Uh, because the doctor is more familiar with the patient, because they wrote a more thorough evaluation, or things like this. When there are two different um, medical opinions or other sources of evidence, this hearing is an opportunity for you to explain why you think one of them um, is more reliable. A third circumstance where hearing can be really useful is where the veteran's credibility is an issue. Um, that's where some or part of the claim is based on the veteran's own statement. And um, there may be some supporting evidence from the record. Maybe there's not a lot of supporting evidence. And sometimes it really turns heavily on uh, whether or not the VA is just going to believe the veteran or how, how much they're going to believe the veteran. And it can be very helpful for that VA decision maker to look the veteran or claimant in the eye and um, have the opportunity to ask questions and get a good sense of, of um, how much they're going to rely on the veteran statement. This is particularly true for claims that involve a character of discharge determination. This is where uh, we have a veteran who has a discharge that's uh, less than honorable, and where the VA is going to have to decide if they're going to give eligibility, they're going to recognize that person as, as a veteran. Uh, we've we found that those can uh, depend a lot on how the VA rater just feels about that veteran. And the opportunity to see the veteran and talk to them, get a sense of that person, can make a big difference. Fourth uh, circumstance where hearings can be really useful is when it's in response to a proposed reduction or termination. That's a specific case called the due process hearing, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail um, in a second. So when can hearings take place? Like I said, it's always at the request of the veteran because they're always optional. It's never required, as far as I know, it's never required for the VA to make a decision. So basically four times when a, a claimant might request a hearing. <coughs> I'm going through each one of these, but just in, as an introduction, they can request hearing as part of initial claim. They can request a hearing after a claim has been denied and when they've appealed it, they have a first opportunity for a hearing at the regional office. That will be a hearing in front of the DRO, a decision review officer. Separately or later in the same claim, if it goes to the Board of Veteran Appeals, they can request a hearing before the BVA. And the fourth circumstance 
when you might request a hearing after you have received a benefit, but then for some reason the VA proposes to terminate or reduce that benefit, you have um, an opportunity for a hearing then, and there's special rules about, about how those um, take place. So let's go through each one of these. Uh, first, the initial claim, um, it's very easy to request. You just say you'd like a hearing on the issue, uh, you know, on a certain issue. And here's an example, <clears throat> a request for a hearing uh, for someone who will need a character of discharge determination because they have a, uh, a less than honorable discharge. Uh, the veteran can always, uh, if they want, request a hearing. We usually don't request a hearing during the initial claim, um, in part because it almost always slows the process down. Also because very often uh, we hope that we've provided enough evidence for the VA to see it the way that we see it and to make the right decision the first time. And so we don't um, request a hearing at first because, because hopefully the VA will get it right um, that time. So there's just a couple of circumstances where you might decide it is necessary to have a hearing from the first, uh, you know, at the initial uh, claim stage. And one of those is for character of discharge. Uh, like I said before, we have found that the opportunity for a veteran to actually tell their story to the VA and the VA person actually see that veteran can make a big, big difference. And so sometimes we do request a hearing even for the initial um, claim because we, we're pretty sure that it's not going to be successful unless that, unless that happens. The second uh, time when uh, claimants might request a hearing is when they have appealed a denial and they uh, request a hearing with the decision review officer. So uh, you filed a claim, the veteran filed a claim, uh, the claim was denied. They have one year to make an appeal. When they make the appeal, they have uh, a choice, and this is just a review of um, claims procedure, so we know where this fits in. Uh, when you make an appeal, you have a choice. One choice is to do what's called the traditional appeal, and that goes directly to the Board of Veteran Appeals, the BVA. The second choice is to request uh, a new review by a senior decision maker at the regional office. Uh, that senior decision maker is called the decision review officer. They're going to look at that claim with fresh eyes and bring more experience to, um, to the table and perhaps come up with a different, uh, different decision. So that is called the DRO review, decision review offer, officer review. Uh, at that time, you can request a hearing with the DRO. You don't have to. You can request this DRO appeal route and have them just uh, reconsider or, or make a new decision based on the claim itself on, on the record. But if you want, you can request a hearing with, it, with that decision review officer. Um, it can be in person or by telephone. So an in-person hearing would be an opportunity for you and the claimant and any other uh, witnesses to go and meet with that decision review officer and have discussion. Uh, sometimes what you want can be done with just a telephone hearing, which basically just means asking the DRO to give you a phone call or give the veteran uh, you know, claimant a phone call so that uh, you know, any specific issue can be ironed out um, that way. The way to request a, uh, a DRO hearing, um, you, uh, when you receive the denial, you have one year to file your notice of disagreement. You file the notice of disagreement. After that, the VA will send a letter to you or to the, the claimant um, explaining the appeal process. And in that letter, they will say, if you want to have a DR re review, you can ask for it. You have 60 days from when they send you that letter to re reply saying, yes, you would like a DRO review. And in that letter, you should say you want a DRO review and you would, you would like a hearing with the DRO. And um, once you do that, you, you wait for the DRO to contact you for the uh, scheduled, scheduled hearing. So that's a, a, a hearing with the DRO. That's a senior adjudicator at the regional office. The third circumstance where you might uh, have a hearing is if you have appealed to the Board of Veteran Appeals. <clears throat> this is a, a hearing with an administrative law judge. Uh, they're all based in Washington, uh, D.C. It's not a staff member of the regional office. It's a staff member, member of the, the VA's central office in Washington. You can request a hearing in person. Uh, the administrative law judges based in, uh, in D.C. travel on a circuit, and they go to each regional office periodically, and so they will schedule hearings when they're uh, at the regional office. You can also request a hearing by video conference. So in that case, you will go to the regional office and they'll set you up at a, in a conference room with a video camera. 
the administrative law judge will be in DC at you know, the other end of the, of the camera. You can have the hearing that way. Uh, they schedule video conferences much more frequently than they schedule in-person hearings. And so if you request a video conference hearing, it will happen uh, sooner than an, an in-person um, hearing. The BVA hearing is with an administrative law judge. This is a, a judge. So it's a bit more formal than hearings with DROs, decision review officers. But I want to emphasize that it's still uh, fairly informal. It's still just going to be sitting around the table with someone in a VA conference room or in someone's office. Um, the administrative law judge will not be wearing a robe. They'll not be sitting on, on a, a dais. They'll be sitting across the table, uh, table from you. It is still just a conversation uh, between everyone present to try to get as much information on the table in order to get the most uh, favorable benefit that the veteran is entitled to. The way to request a, a BVA hearing is um, to do it on the Form 9. The Form 9 is how you, has how you appeal to, to the, uh, the BVA after getting a statement of the case. Uh, you'll see uh, in, in Block 8 on the form here, you can uh, say you do not want a hearing. You can say you want it by a video conference or you want it at, your, uh, at uh, the regional office uh, when they're scheduled to travel to the travel hearing. The fourth time when you might want to do a hearing is um, what's called the due process hearing. So whenever the VA ha thinks that it needs to reduce or terminate a benefit, certain requirements kick in for the VA. Um, they can't simply cut you off if they think that um, that you're entitled to less than they're giving you. They have to give you notice of this proposed reduction, and they have to give you an opportunity for a hearing, me, opportunity, a hearing to dispute that before they actually implement that reduction. So, some examples of how this might happen: a pension overpayment. So, some of you have been getting pension. It turns out they were also just collecting Social Security at the same time, and that had not been reported to the VA. Um, so they should have been getting less money than they were actually getting, but the VA didn't notice it, didn't know that. One day, the VA notices that, you ha that the veteran hasn't received Social Security, um, and <clears throat> so the VA realizes that they, they should have been actually paying less. The VA may say, we've, we've been paying you too much. Uh, based on the new calculation, we're going to reduce your payment um, taking into account your Social Security, uh, and we're going to ask you to you know, return the money that, that we paid you. So this is a reduction um, and a benefit. Um, the VA has to notify you of this before they actually kick in that change. Um, and they have to give you notification 60 days before it kicks in. If within the first 30 days of when the veteran is notified of that proposed future reduction, if in that 30-day period, the veteran says, wait, you know, I, I think you've made a mistake. That's not correct. I would like to talk about this with you. Um, I'd like to have a hearing on that issue. Then the VA cannot make that termination or make that reduction until after it has had that hearing and looked at the evidence you provided uh, and taken that into consideration. So this can be really a really important opportunity if the VA may have made a mistake. Because not only does it give you a chance to actually uh, to discuss it, because if, if, in case the VA had made a mistake, to show them a mistake, but it will postpone the VA's implementation of that decision. It will postpone the actual reduction until you've already had the chance to, to discuss it. Um, if you send in this request for a hearing after 30 days have passed, you will still get the hearing. Um, well, I take that back. If you if you dispute that proposed reduction within the one-year appeal window, um, then you uh, will still have a hearing. Um, it will proceed like any other appeal. Uh, you file a notice of disagreement. You can ask for a hearing with a decision review officer to get that corrected. Um, but that special rule where they have to pause any action, pause any reduction termination until after the hearing has taken place, in order to take advantage of that, you have to make the request within 30 days of getting that, that proposal. So a pension overpayment is one example um, where they might reduce or terminate benefit, and they have to give you a due process hearing if you ask for it uh, within 30 days of being notified of the proposal. A second one uh, is a rating reduction. Another example is if the hospital proposes to cancel healthcare eligibility. 
So we've seen this happen a few times. <clears throat> uh, you know, a veteran has been getting health care from the VA, um, but the veteran did not serve the minimum time and service requirement, for example. Or uh, let's just stick with that example. So someone served for 18 months. They didn't complete their full ter term. They were called to active duty. But they've been getting health care anyway. One day, some of the hospital realized this is happening. And they said, wait a second, I, I think this person is not actually eligible. I think that we're supposed to be denying them eligibility uh, because they don't satisfy the minimum time and service requirement. Uh, if that's true, then the, then the VA can't provide health care. But before terminating that benefit, before uh, terminating them from health care eligibility, they have to give them notice that they're going to do it. Uh, and then if the veteran asks for a hearing within 30 days, they can't actually cut off health care until they've had that hearing to make a more informed decision. Final example is if the VA proposes to assign a fiduciary. If the VA proposes to declare someone as being incompetent, that means that they're going to they're going to uh, stop giving money directly to the veteran, give it to a payee instead. That's another circumstance where <clears throat> the veteran can request a hearing and the VA can't implement that decision until after the hearing has taken place. So what is the representative's role at these hearings? In terms of uh, preparation, the, the first thing, of course, is review the claim. Often you may have requested the hearing on the veteran's behalf a year ago, maybe more, and then all of a sudden you get a notification that, that the administrative law judge is coming to town and you're scheduled to be via hearing. So you've got to refresh your memory about what this, this uh, claim is really about. Identify the information that you want to highlight. Um, usually there's one issue that's in question and you think there's a couple pieces of evidence that really make the case and you think the VA has overlooked it. So you want to make sure that you are focused on that information. That's going to um, that's going to hopefully change the outcome of the of the um, of the case. You can that information can come from documents. That information can come from the veteran. That information can come from other witnesses that the veteran invites to come um, to the hearing. So you want to identify those ahead of time. Uh, you want to explain to the veteran or the claimant what the hearing is going to be like. They may be intimidated. They may not know what's going to what's going to happen. Be sure they understand that this is a conversation with someone at the VA, that person at the VA also wants the best outcome for the veteran. It's informal. They can say whatever, um, whatever they want to say. Um, that being said, while the veteran can say whatever um, they want to say, you're probably going to want to make sure certain things come out. So you're going to want to prepare certain questions um, that you're going to ask the veteran to make sure that the veteran doesn't forget any essential information. It's a good idea as part of your preparation to let the veteran know you're going to do that. This isn't cheating. This is just um, you know, avoiding a situation where the veteran might feel blindsided. So part of preparation, you might sketch out the questions you're going to ask and then sit down with the veteran and make sure they, they know that that's coming. At the hearing itself, uh, you'll show up with, with the veteran or claimant any uh, witnesses that the veteran wants to, to bring. If you have any additional material to provide, any additional evidence, you can do that. So you'll provide that at, at, at the beginning uh, to the decision maker. The next thing that you'll want to do is to give a brief introduction to make sure everyone's on the same, same page about what the issue, um, what the issue is. Uh, so we, this, is, you know, this is a statement that starts with something like, you know, this is about uh, showing whether or not injury actually happened in service. Uh, this is about the credibility of the veteran's statement because the veteran said that it did occur and we have some additional witnesses who are there going to support that. Um, this, this sort of frames the discussion so everyone's on the same page about what, uh, what the issue will, uh, will be. The next one, step after you finish that introduction is you can start asking questions of the veteran to uh, prompt them to tell their story. Uh, at any point in this process, the VA uh, rater, the, the decision review officer, the administrative law judge, they might, they might cut in and start asking questions themselves and that's fine. Too. This is a this is a discussion. Um, no one's cross-examining anybody. It's fine for anyone to ask their questions they want. Uh, sometimes when I, uh, these happen, it ends up being a question, uh, a conversation, just between that VA uh, rating official and the veteran, and uh, the representative can just sit back and watch it happen, just waiting to make sure that the veteran is not leaving anything out. And if you feel that there's some information being skipped over, you can step in and ask you know a pointed question to invite that veteran or claimant to say 
the additional information that, that you know would be um, would be helpful. Finally, once the conversation has run its course and you think that everything um, that you wanted to show, the veteran wanted to show, has, has been um, put on the table, you can then ask the hearing officer if they think any information is missing. Um, basically, you're you know, asking for a hint from the rating officer of what kind of information they feel like they need in order to give you the claim. You're allowed to ask that. That's also not that's also not cheating. Um, so if the, if the the rating official you know sort of leaning towards uh, granting a claim but feels like it needs more medical evidence, needs some more cro you know more corroborating evidence, some more statements from family or friends, um, you can ask. Hey, you know what 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 do you think um, would be helpful to make this claim successful and uh, and maybe you'll yeah, you'll get some suggestions on how you can follow up to, to, to improve the chances of success. So that uh, covers hearings. We talked about what's the purpose of, uh, of a hearing, when they're valuable, basically the four times uh, when they are likely to happen during the initial claim, uh, during appeal at the regional office, that's a hearing with a decision review officer, during appeal at the Board of Veterans' Appeals, that's going to be hearing with an administrative law judge. And then the fourth is a due process hearing. Um, that's a hearing that you request when the VA has proposed to reduce or terminate a benefit. And if you request that within 30 days of notification of the proposed reduction, then the VA won't make any change until after you've had the hearing and, and made your case. And then finally, we talked about uh, pointers for how to prepare and to uh, um, how to participate in a hearing. All right, the next, uh, next topic, healthcare enrollment. And we will uh, talk about uh, the priority groups and how that works. Uh, oh, okay, I apologize. The, um, the heading is out of, out of order. The enrollment section is later. I apologize. We'll do enrollment in a second. Um, healthcare for people with other honorable discharges. <clears throat> so we're going to review healthcare eligibility based on discharge characterization. We're going to talk about one exception to the rule, and that's healthcare for people with other than honorable discharges. And we're going to mention a couple other exceptions where veterans can get healthcare even if they have a disqualifying discharge. So a review of VA eligibility based on discharge characterization. <clears throat> In order uh, for the VA to recognize you as a veteran, you have to have been discharged under conditions other than dishonorable. What this means in practice, um, and this is a simplification a bit, but this is generally the case. In practice, this means that if the service member has an honorable <coughs> discharge, general discharge, or an uncharacterized discharge, the VA is going to treat them as having served honorably and recognize them as a veteran. The VA calls this honorable for VA purposes, HVAP. If it, veteran has a dishonorable or a bad conduct discharge, then the VA may find them dishonorable for VA purposes, DVAP. If it's in the middle, if it's an other than honorable discharge, or if it's certain kinds of bad conduct discharge, then the VA uh, gets to decide if they're going to be uh, regarded as, as having served honorably for VA purposes and therefore eligible for, for benefits. So, um, if someone uh, has an other honorable discharge, as with all benefits, uh, before the VA grants a benefit, they're going to do a character of discharge determination, give them a thumbs up or thumbs down <coughs> uh, assessment. If they are thumbs up, if it's honorable for VA purposes, then they are um, eligible for everything. Uh, what, happen what happens if the VA decides that they were found dishonorable for VA purposes? So we have an, someone with an OTH discharge, other than honorable discharge. Uh, the VA finds that they serve uh, dishonorably overall. They're found uh, dishonorable for VA purposes. Generally, they can't get uh, many benefits from the VA, but there is an exception. Uh, and the exception is that uh, if the VA finds that a veteran was VVAP, dishonorable for VA purposes, um, and if they have an other than honorable discharge, then they can get health care for service-connected conditions. This applies only if they have an OTH or undesirable discharge. It does not apply if they had a bad conduct discharge or a, a dishonorable discharge. They won't get compensation for that condition. They can just go to the VA health center and get treatment uh, for the service-connected conditions. 
two ways to apply for this. <clears throat> the first way, uh, which is uh, more, we, we found it to be more reliable, file a compensation claim for that condition. Um, so um, let's take as an example uh, a veteran who served in Vietnam uh, and now has uh, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. So we know that type 2 diabetes is a presumptive uh, condition for uh, veterans who served in Vietnam. So this would be a very easy service-connected condition. But this veteran has an OTH discharge of an honorable discharge. Now, um, if that person had an honorable discharge, they would apply uh, for compensation. Um, they would be they would be automatically found found to have served honorably uh, for VA purposes, and so it would proceed to a service connection uh, determination, and they would they would find presumptively that was service connected. If the person has an other than honorable discharge, when they file a compensation claim, the first thing the VA is going to do is look at the discharge and recognize that they have an other than honorable discharge, an OTH discharge, and so they're going to stop. They're not going to do the service connection yet. They're first going to look at the character of service to make a uh, decision on whether the person served honorably or dishonorably. If they decide that the person served dishonorably, the VA is supposed to then automatically go ahead and do the service connection analysis anyway. So they will decide, no, this person served dishonorably for VA purposes. They're not going to be recognized as a veteran and given most VA benefits. But we're going to determine if their diabetes is service connected anyway because we know that if they if it is service connected, that person can get health care from a VA medical center. So filing compensation claim for someone who has an OTH discharge will automatically uh, trigger the uh, a service uh, a service connection uh, adjudication, even if that person is uh, dishonorable for VA purposes, so that the VA can tell the veteran if they get health care for that service connected condition. Um, for this this example, this veteran with diabetes. If that is the case, if they are found dishonorable for purposes, but the diabetes is service connected, they can't get compensation for diabetes, but they can go to the VA Health Center and get treatment for that. Uh, the second way to, uh, to request eligibility for this health care ex exception is to go to the VA Medical Center eligibility office, ask the eligibility office to complete a Form 10-7131. That's an internal form. The veteran can't download it and fill out themselves. It's a form that only the eligibility office can, can fill out. And that's the way that the hospital essentially asks the regional office to do that same process that the compensation claim did. It asks the, uh, it asks the regional office to do a character of discharge review and also to determine service connection for that health condition uh, for the purpose of determining health care. At the same time, uh, when you ask the LGBT office to do that, to make that request, you can also ask the LGBT office to grant tentative eligibility. What this means is um, the, the hospital can say, look, we don't know yet if you're going to be eligible. We have to do an adjudication of service connection and character discharge. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for that to happen, we're going to grant you temporary tentative eligibility. Uh, if that if the hospital does that, that's, that's great because that can be an extra two years of health care um, that wouldn't otherwise be available to the, to the veteran. On the other hand, usually when the hospitals grant tentative eligibility, they also make the veteran sign an agreement uh, committing to pay back the hospital for whatever services they receive if at the end of the adjudication process they're found ineligible. So there's some some pros and cons to going the second route um, of going to the hospital and getting tentative eligibility. So this is a, a major exception to the general rule that people with disqualifying discharges can't get VA benefits. They can get health care for service connection if they have an other than honorable uh, or an undesirable discharge. There's a couple other exceptions that are good to know about. Um, one is uh, resources at the vet center. So the vet centers are um, counseling centers, uh, usually in, separate from the medical centers um, at sort of downtown uh, sites. They provide uh, mental health counseling for combat veterans and for survivors of sexual assault, MST, uh, regardless of discharge characterization. 
Also, uh, survivors of sexual assault of MSD can get medical treatment uh, for conditions associated with the sexual assault at uh, any VA health center. So the vet center doesn't provide prescriptions. It doesn't provide medicine or breath counseling. However, uh, conditions related to sexual assault can receive medical treatment uh, at uh, VA health centers. All right, a, th a third topic that I'll, I'll cover um, is enrolling for VA healthcare. So there's two, two stages to obtaining uh, VA healthcare. First, you have to be eligible, and second, you have to be enrolled. What's the difference? Uh, eligibility for VA healthcare just means that you are recognized as a veteran with a minimum time and, and service requirement. It means that you are potentially uh, able to get uh, VA healthcare. However, there's many more eligible veterans than there are, than there is capacity at, at the VA health center. So a few decades ago, Congress said, all right, we're going to let the VA decide who actually gets in. And that's the enrollment system. Um, even though every recognized veteran with minimum time and service requirement is theoretically potentially eligible for VA health care, um, the, the VA controls the numbers people actually getting in by deciding who gets to then enroll. And they have done this by establishing several priority groups. Uh, and um, each year the VA can change the definition of the priority groups, the number of priority groups, and the cutoff, how high on the priority groups you have to be in order for you to actually, um, actually uh, enroll for VA healthcare. And so we'll, we'll give an overview of what those priority groups are. The priority groups are based on a few different factors, um, whether the person has a disability rating, their income, service, um, facts of service, and some other factors. Um, and it does change, uh, or it can, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to, but it can change um, every year. I think the last time it was changed was 2009. Um, Congress has said that some veterans are exempt from enrollment. And what this basically means is uh, that that this, the VA always has to accept them for, for health care. Um, the, uh, the VA can never sort of um, you know, tighten up its admissions. Um, you know, can't limit its, its admissions so much that they, don't, that they don't get access to VA health care. They're sort of outside the enrollment requirement. So here are the priority groups. Uh, there's a lot of information here. I put a link to the VA's website page where it describes the priority groups. And so if you ever need to um, assist a, you know, a veteran uh, or, or determine whether an eligibility, what their priority group would be for enrollment, then you can go to the website to get more information. But essentially, the ones for whom enrollment is not required, that means the ones for whom um, your access to VA health care is, is guaranteed, are those who have at least a 50% service uh, connected disability. Also, um, enrollment is not required for treatment for service-connected conditions, so a VA hospital um, can never deny you access um, for uh, you know, to register to get treatment for a service-connected condition. Uh, then we have the, the following priority groups. You should know right now that the, right, that currently um, the VA is admitting all of these priority groups, and so anyone who falls into any of these categories can enroll and will be um, will be admitted. So at the moment, there is no functional difference between being in priority three and priority group four, for example. Being in a priority group doesn't determine your priority for actual treatment. It's just uh, where the cutoffs are for who's going to be allowed to register for VA healthcare. Right now, all of these people can register for um, for healthcare. So it's not necessarily uh, important to know if you're, if you're in priority group two or three, just as long as you know that you're in there. Uh, one situation where it does matter what priority group you're in uh, is uh, when deciding if you have to make a copayment. So for priority groups one through six, there is no copayment required. Uh, healthcare is free. If you only fall in priority group seven or eight, then you have to uh, make a copayment. Uh, that means um, uh, make payment for for medicines. I actually don't know off the top of my head if there's payment for inpatient treatment, but there's definitely for prescription medications. So that matters. If you're in one of the bottom groups or 
in groups one through six, then that determines your copayment. But every, all of these people can uh, can um, enroll for uh, for health care. Uh, something I want to highlight is group six um, because I'm referencing certain eligibility criteria in passing, and I want to make sure that you're you're aware of where you get more information about those. Um, Prior group six includes people with compensable 0% service-connected disabilities. What this means is it's a disability the VA um, has found to be service-connected, and it is a compensable disability, uh, which means that you, in theory you could have a higher rating. Um, but at this point, the severity is so low that you don't even get a 10% rating. That's what a 0% service connection um, refers to. But on top of the third bullet point, um, it, it identifies veterans with certain environmental exposures. So service in Vietnam, um, that's included because if you serve in Vietnam, then you are presumptively exposed to Agent Orange, and so that puts you in priority six. Certain Camp Lejeune veterans, you may be aware that uh, for a long period, I think between the 1950s and 1980s, there was contamination of groundwater at Camp Lejeune. Uh, last year, Congress recognized that these may have been causing illness um, for service members and their families. And so people who serve at Camp Lejeune at those certain times um, can be put in part of Group 6. Um, so if someone comes to you who serve at Camp Lejeune, then it's good to look up those dates exactly, find out if that person is eligible for part of Group 6. Um, and then the last one there is veterans with with conditions that might relate to Gulf War service. That refers only to the first Gulf War period. I think the years are 1990, 1998. Um, so if you have someone coming in that served in that time frame, you might want to check exactly the dates of their service um, to see if they may fall into that, that category. Priority group seven, priority group, group eight, those are the two priority groups um, where there is a copayment. Th those are based on income. Um, priority group seven is where your income is under regional limits. Uh, the VA has uh, made income thresholds by zip code, I think it's by zip code, or, or by county. You can go to the website shown there, plug in the veteran's location, and it will tell you what are the, the regional income thresholds um, based on their location. And if their income is below that, then they fall in priority group seven. It's broken down um, for single veterans and also veterans of with one or two or three or, or more dependents. So you can find out exactly what the cutoff is in that location. Prior groups, prior group eight, subgroups A through D, are for veterans with income who is less than 10% above the regional limit. They call that a relaxed uh, geographic, um, uh, uh, I apologize, I forget the word, but um, a threshold, I think, geographic threshold, income threshold. So again, you can go to the same web website, plug in uh, the veteran's number of dependents, plug in where they live. It will tell you what is their income cutoff in order to fall into that last um, priority group, so groups A through D. Um, so this breaks it down by priority group. There's sort of, um, this, this reduces it to sort of most important information. Because like I said, it doesn't actually matter if you're in priority group three versus priority group four. Um, the important things for veterans is are they going to get free health care or are they going to get health care with a co-payment? So free health care is going to be available to anybody with a compensable service connected disability, anyone with income below the pension limit, or anyone with, with, who has pension with aid and attendance or housebound benefits. Uh, anyone with, who is a prisoner of war, uh, received a medal of honor or purple heart, anyone with these certain ex environmental exposures. And for post-9-11 combat veterans, um, they can get free health care for five years after discharge. That's free health care. Health care is also available with co-payments for anyone whose income is less than 10% above the geographic uh, limit. Uh, that's the situation right now. Uh, the VA might change that in the future. They might reduce the which priority groups are eligible. They might expand um, the priority groups to make more people um, eligible for enrollment. Uh, that is uh, the end of a topic on uh, healthcare enrollment, and so uh, now I'm going to switch it back to uh, Katie. Kevin, can you um, send it back to, to Katie?
Um, hi everyone, this is Katie. Uh, I'm going to be talking about fee basis care now. Uh, let me get there. There we go. Um, fee basis care is provided by non-VA facilities that are reimbursed by the VA. Last year, Congress passed a veter the Veterans Access Choice and Accountability Act, which provides that the VA has to, re to cover the cost of non-VA care under certain circumstances, which include uh, if the veteran will have to wait more than 30 days for care, and then the other three based on the geographic location more than 40 miles or needs to travel by plane or boat or um, over mountains, across water, et cetera. Uh, those people can go to um, non-VA facilities for care. Uh, they need to get authorization first. Um, they will be authorized as long as the VA facilities are not feasibly available and the veteran falls into one of 15 categories. So um, if a veteran goes to a non-VA facility uh, and does so because it's not feasible for her to go to a VA facility for treatment, and she falls into one of 15 categories, um, then uh, she'll, sh the care will be reimbursed. The 15 categories, several of them are service-connected disabilities or related. Um, number eight is any disability of a woman veteran. Number nine is any disability of a veteran in Alaska, Hawaii, the Virgin Islands, or other territories. Um, any disability of veteran participating in vocational rehabilitation. Um, they're pretty broad, pretty broad categories. Uh, and so the, um, the question is whether the care was not feasibly available. And that means that um, the urgency of the veteran's medical condition made it necessary or economically advisable to use a non-VA facility or the distance involved made it economically advisable to use a non-VA facility, or the nature of the treatment required makes it made it necessary or economically advisable to use a non-VA facility. If they fit those requirements, then uh, authorization will be granted. It can be granted either by in person, like verbally in person or by phone but written confirmation should be provided within two work days. And you're going to definitely want to have that written confirmation so you don't get stuck with the bill. And then there's the issue of emergency treatment. Reimbursement for unauthorized non-VA treatment. Um, so this is um, in an emergency where obviously the, the veteran doesn't have time to go get authorization. They just go to the closest uh, hospital or wherever the ambulance takes them. Um, so in order to get reimbursement for that, they must show that um, it, it was indeed an emergency, that it uh, was for a service-connected disability or other disability that was aggravating a service-connected disability or for any disability of a veteran rated permanently and totally disabled. And VA facilities were not feasibly available and an attempt to use them would not have been reasonable. Uh, disputes with the VA often arise over what specific procedures are covered when a veteran receives authorization. Um, so this is, again, talking about um, author where, where there is authorization, there are disputes. As with emergency treatment where there's no authorization, there's true, uh, disputes about what treatment was required uh, and what um, whether a treatment um, was unnecessary, that um, and the VA will will uh, debate that with the veteran or the hospital at issue about whether they're going to pay back for that treatment. With the med medical emergency um, care, an emergency is defined as a situation of such nature that a prudent layperson would reasonably expect that delay in seeking immediate medical attention 
would be hazardous to life or health. Uh, we also have another type of uh, emergency for those veterans who have no other health insurance. They will be eligible for uh, reimbursement for emergency services if um, the veteran was enrolled in the VA healthcare system and received care from the VA within 24 months prior to the emergency, the veteran is personally liable for the cost of treatment and there was a medical emergency as defined. And the claim must be filed within 90 days of the date of discharge and no payments will be made um, after the period where the vet can be transferred safely to a VA facility. What we find, uh, we, we get a number of um, complaints in our office from veterans who uh, believe they were in an emergency situation, were taken by ambulance, um, and uh, now the VA is not going to reimburse them. And what happens a lot in San Francisco is that the ambulances don't want to drive out to the VA medical center because it's too far, and so they'll take veterans to uh, San Francisco General Hospital or, uh, or other places that are nearer. And then um, this means the veteran has the good possibility of getting stuck with the bill if they can't prove it was a medical emergency. And the VA interprets what an emergency is very strictly. Um, they're, they're very picky about what an emergency is and that is uh, a problem for veterans and so the what we can do is we can help the veteran uh, explain why to the VA why the situation that occurred was a medical emergency and explain that the other factors that are, are required for reimbursement that the veteran was liable for the cost of treatment and the veteran was enrolled in the VA healthcare system. So you can write a letter on the veteran's behalf um, stating this and, and um, talking about the, the definition of medical emergency uh, that a prudent layperson would reasonably expect that delay in seeking immediate medical attention would be hazardous to life or to health. So you need to explain why uh, that is the case. Often they VA denies quickly and then it's up to the veteran at that point to appeal. An appeal can should be filed at the VA um, medical facilities fee basis office and sh also what should go to the regional office. You want to file in both places. And uh, I think that at least here in San Francisco they seem to have at the fee basis office they're not familiar with appeals. They don't seem to know what to do with them, and in my, in my experience, they just disappear. So, um, so I'm relying on the regional office to uh, follow up on these because um, nothing's happening on the on the side of the medical facility. Okay, I'm going to talk now about vocational rehabilitation, and I'll go over this pretty quickly. Um, Voc rehab consists of an evaluation of the individual's abilities, skills, and interests. Vocational counseling and planning training, such as on-the-job and work experience programs and certificate two or four-year college or technical programs, assistance in finding and maintaining suitable employment, and supportive rehabilitation services and additional counseling to assist in achieving independence in daily living. So depending upon the abilities, the level of dis disability impairment or other impairment of the veteran, the Voc Rehab Office determines what sort of um, training might be appropriate or rehabilitation. The initial evaluation serves as the basis to determine entitlement and to identify and clarify rehabilitation issues, try to develop uh, solutions to issues, um, come up with employment or independent living op options, establish a rehabilitation goal, 
and uh, establish objectives for veterans who are entitled to the benefits um, and, um, and refer out those who turn out not to be entitled to benefits. The goal of the initial evaluation, determine veterans' eligibility and suitability for education or training, identify the veterans' interests and objectives, abilities, identify suitable vocational objectives, identify the veterans' limitations, whether economic, um, disability-related, service-connected or non-service-connected, um, educational background, things of those nature. Identify ability to overcome impairments, feasibility of achieving a vocational goal. Then they receive a certif certification of entitlement, and they um, they are the subject of a individual employment assistance plan. The VA assigns a counselor, a vocational rehabilitational I'm sorry, a vocational rehabilitation counselor, to select uh, the suitable vocational objective that is consistent with the veteran's abilities, aptitudes, and interests, and that does not aggravate the veteran's disabilities. Uh, different tools can be used to assess the skill level and aptitude tests of various sorts or records, uh, medical records, uh, school records. Another goal of initial evaluation is development and analysis of information necessary to obtain an understanding of the whole individual and also determine the effects of the service-connected disability on obtaining employment and assessing it over uh, assessing other life circumstances. The vocational rehabilitation counselor is supposed to guide the individual in the selection of an appropriate rehabilitation goal. This is done with the uh, help of the employment coordinator who assists the counselor and the veteran in the development of a rehabilitation plan by providing labor market information, employment and salary information, and job specific information and other information related to successful hiring. Uh, based on, sorry, based on the um, the, veter the veterans' level of aptitude and abilities, they'll be placed in one of three levels, which determines how closely they will be followed by the counselor once they're assigned to the rehabilitation or education or employment. And level one is for the most skilled individuals. Level three is for those with the most impairments. Uh, and, and challenges to overcome. And then they're placed, uh, if they're going to be placed in employment, there are five tracks. A reemployment track is for those like who are in the National Guard or Reserves who are returning to employers that they previously worked for. And that would be short-term training provided. The second is rapid access to employment for veterans who express a desire to obtain an employment as soon as possible and already have skills to qualify. That would include job skills assessment, um, employment preparation. Employment through long-term services is for veterans who need long-term services such as remedial or refresher courses, specialized training, and or post-secondary education to obtain and maintain suitable employment. Self-employment is for veterans who have limited access to traditional employment. Uh, they may want to work flexible work schedules or need more accommodation from work. Uh, they have to have an uh, interest in some financial resource and aptitude to pursue self-employment. Finally, independent living uh, is for veterans where the pursuit of a vocational goal is determined not currently reasonably feasible. To the, due to the effects of their disability. Based on whatever track um, the veteran is placed in will determine what services and support will be provided to that veteran. So that's it for our PowerPoint presentation. So I would now like to open it up to questions or comments from 
you out there. Uh, we'd be glad to hear any comments you have about the presentation or any cases that you've personally worked on that have been unusual or interesting uh, or questions on anything we've covered. Okay, Katie, we don't have any questions from uh, the Solano office with John and Lee, so I'm just going to mm -hmm. wait a little bit longer to see if anybody else has any questions before we uh, okay. decide if we're going to wrap up. Okay. Anybody got questions? Send them in to us, please. Oh. No questions at this time from Arlen Sandoval either. So, uh, Katie, if you would like to just uh, give your contact information and wrap up, um, I think we can conclude. Okay, sure. Um, I wanted to um, let you know that I'm going to be having the next OJT training, Webinar 3, will be on March 17th, no, sorry, March 24th, at the same time at 2 to 3.30. And then um, the next one after the, that is two weeks later, or April 7th, from 2 to 3.30. And we'll be covering the latter half of the training manual.